Hello, everybody. My name is Slava Mikhailov. I'm senior solution architect. Uh, I used to do and design various systems for many, many years in many different companies. And DevOps usually was a problem for me and my projects. Not really a problem, but was a challenging thing. And I would like to touch this surface today during this talk, talking about how the DevOps should look like and what kind of functions it should perform from the perspective of a developer. Because I am being a software architect, mostly, mostly a developer. I, I was a developer for a long time. And I know what, what things I'm missing from DevOps. And I would like to talk about it today. So we definitely will, during this talk, we will talk about what DevOps is. We will discuss what kind of knowledge we as a developers would like DevOps to bring to the project. And what are the most frequent issues we face? And also I will share some, ex some examples from my past, most dramatic issues, I would say, and how we can leverage, how we can leverage knowledge of everybody to, to to improve it, yeah. So what's DevOps is? DevOps basically is a connection, connection between development and operations. We as a developer, we produce code, right? So we, we know we know requirements, we understand, usually understand projects and project needs, we usually understand business, and we try to, to write a lot of code. And from our perspective, we do a lot of, a lot of stuff. And we think that there should be somebody or we could actually even treat DevOps not as a person, but as more as a discipline. So we should some have some process which we hand over our code to and we do not really responsible for daily operations for delivery to production or to test testing environment or any part of the life cycles which happens to um, up my code after i release it or or even committed to to my to my repository this is the view of 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 the of of the developer and let's dive a bit deeper into that so basically devops as fundamentally is a glue between development and production. So it's basically where we ship our code. So we do not ship our code to, 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 to client. We, we, we basically transfer it to DevOps hands. And we expect DevOps act pretty much the same manner like we act being, being developers. Like when we write, write code, we concerned about some copy paste. We concerned about quality of code. We concerned about automation, concerned about testing and everything. And we expect DevOps could do the same or at least kind of something looked like this. And, but unfortunately reality is different. So basically is this funny picture shows that kind of, you probably saw it on the internet that people definitely treat each other differently and let's cons let's just think what are, what is the demand from from others to to devop so from the client perspective or operation perspective what do they need they need to have stable low cost environment they want to basically achieve maximum spending minimum minimum amount of money because th that's basically what business is about they need to be efficient they need to to watch their cost they need to to consider to be conservative because they, it is about business it's all about money and that's why it's quite very important for them uh it should be again easy and saying easy to to manage means often cheap because for business, easy, it's, it's about knowledge. It's about qualification of people who are responsible for that. And if the processes 
do not require quite sophisticated stuff, then it's cheaper, cheaper to have kind of uh, the same team with less knowledge or less people is if it is more automated. So every everything more or less end up with kind of money conversion. And as a client, if I would be a client, I definitely would expect my uh, environment to be flexible because I want it to scale as my demand scale. For instance, if I have some Christmas sale, like obvious example, I want my number of servers grows up without me really handling it. And I assume this comes out of the box. And this is what operational part is about, but it is what should be covered from our perspective, from developer's perspective, what should be covered by DevOps on the projects. Let's go next. Um, next is a QA engineer. So we kind of going backwards, so backwards from client to, to back to developers. QA is the, is the previous frontier before, before get, giving some, something to production. So they obviously have their own goals and this is how DevOps could, could help QA team with uh, satisfying their daily needs. First, what, what they definitely need, they need to have an environment close to production. Close means very, very similar. So if for instance, there is a scaling or some high availability or things like that, it preferably should be replicated for the testing environment because they could reveal some corner cases which are not visible on dev environment or on a simple testing environment. And having close to production environment means that you often this this environment is quite expensive because there could be multi-region databases or some load balancing or things like that and if there are many machines many databases that could cause significant spending end of the day and it means that this kind of environment should be rather be switchable or on and off depending on i don't know demand for instance, if we need to test something closer to the end of iteration or before, right before we go to production, when we run the kind of full cycles of tests, or for instance, we could turn it on for nightly tests and nightly builds. Also, we would like if our products is about, is a sort of box product and which we d deliver to PCs and Macs in different configurations and which could be installed on different machines, then I might want to have a series of, of different environments, which I would like to sp spawn on demand, obviously, because I cannot test all of them, but I don't need them all the time again. But here is the keys of variety, a variety of different <laughs> number of gigabytes resolutions or CPUs, versions of operation system and so on. It is rather important to be able to handle that as well. Uh, ideally, ideally, that is, I really, I, I, I saw that just a few, in a few cases in my, in my history, but uh, ideally it would be very good to be able to have an environment created for QA team on demand. When, when a team would like to start testing something, they usually compete for environment because they need to deploy a particular version in it. And competing means usually delay because we cannot test multiple projects on the same, on the same server simultaneously. So we either wait or we need to create another environment, which is not that easy. And usually it is end up with waiting, just waiting. So we cannot really, we cannot really uh, test everything altogether. 
we obviously can handle it somehow with development capabilities like support multi-tenancy or introduce some multi-version environments but it's a different story it's 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 also not that that simple so it is it is it might be very useful in some cases to have environment be able to create on demand and the last but not the least is ability to copy or making a snapshot of production to verify certain bugs or revalidate some 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 issues or things like that and for that case it would be good to be able to copy existing production back to test and sometimes this is quite complicated job because it's not only copying we should be concerned about the data about personal information about obfuscation and about everything related to that so we because copying production data is not possible all the time but we should be able to copy at least some part of it to create proper repeatable or to create an environment for reproducing of issues and it is quite important switching next and now we get to developer so me as a developer I would like to have a sort of abstraction between me and production because I want to just have my code shipped and that's it so frankly I don't want to deal with any servers I don't want to know configurations I don't want to know especially for for development because I need some resources to run my my my, my application and it covers most of the cases you you definitely could say that okay so listen there is there are non-functional requirements you might need some specific hardware you may need some number of cpus and memory and you should definitely as a developer should know that yes that's true but not all the time most often at least at least for the initial phases it doesn't really matter what kind of server you give us just give us something we just need to be able to run our product on something in cloud or on-prem just to be able to test it and give this to our QA team this is what we need if we end of the day figure out that it's not efficient is slow for whatever reason then we definitely will ask you to increase it and we will deal with uh, with non-functional requirements a bit later but for in initial phases we just want to have something to run our code on and it is it is important to have it our days it is assumed pretty much for every project that there is continuous integration and continuous deployment exist from the very beginning so we would like to have the code compiled and deploy it automatically at the moment we commit new change and it is sort of a sanity thing so it should exist for every single project no exclusion mostly no no exclusion probably some i don't know hardware specific whatever project might might not need it but majority 99.99 percent .99%, they definitely need this and next thing is that we need dev environment like i said in, in the first item we need dev environment running since the very first day because we need to start deploying it we need to start turning this deployment scripts we need to have it working because as kind of the latest trend goes we we have more and more microservices architecture and in microservices you shouldn't even start going microservices if you are not willing to do automation and that's why we need all all of this kind in place from the very very first day 
Um, like I mentioned for QA team, we need to we need access to the data for troubleshooting. And data in this case means mostly obfuscated data. So we mostly need structure and data samples to to be able to debug some complex issues. And here develop DevOps can help us to, to establish proper obfuscation mechanisms or data migrations mechanism, which we when we can extract data from, from production and ensure that it is safe and there is no policy violated. It is very important to, to keep that in mind all the time. And also developers as kind of they treat DevOps like like they they are. I mean like develop like a developer. So there are a lot of expected things from from DevOps to act to act as a developer. And I will touch it a bit later a bit more. So what do we need day one when we start a project? We definitely need development environment. That's that's thing number one. There should be source control, continuous integration, continuous deployment. We need some deep server, just a cheap one, whatever, no need to, to set up any redundancy, any disaster recovery, nothing. So we can kill deep server any given moment and recreate it. It's very cheap and very simple, but it should exist. And we expect that basic things like source control recommendations, uh, continuous integration scripts, continuous de delivery, kind of comes with a DevOps we take to the team as basically as a package. So we assume that after many years of experience, every single DevOps should be able to roll out those basic, I would say fundamental items instantly. So they kind of should have recipes for all of these things because we we assume they, they are kind of should exist all the time and there are not, not such a big variety for that. We have kind of three major clouds. We have just a few different source controls we work with. Uh, Git pretty much a standard everywhere. So, so I mean, for us, it's, it's it's just trivial. It should exist from day one, and that that's a problem, usually, unfortunately. But we kind of trying to make the situation better. Um, and it should kind of work for all many major clouds like Azure, Google, and Amazon. Um, and day one, there should be an automation. Automation is a key thing, like I mentioned, for recent architectures. Without automation, one should not even try to, to, do, to do microservices or even kind of Kappa and so kind of more granular architectures because it will be a pain end of the day deploying everything manually. So day one, DevOps, alongside with developers should start doing automation for everything on the platform. Day two. Day two assumes that we started doing something. We have some, because how, how it works normally. Normally we kind of try to, we, we, we talk to a client, we, we, we understand the requirements. We start prototyping something, we start kind of designing architecture. And it is the moment when we basically start the development. And that that was the day one. Day two is when we kind of have first sprint over. And it means that we are ready to test something. And right before that, it would be nice to have test environment ready. And test environment should be kind of a bit more sophisticated than then dev, dev environment, but it still could be quite simplified. There, there's no need to, to be production ready, but it should be automatically deployable, automatically creatable. It obviously it should, 
should be covered by infrastructure as a code with many different kinds of tools we have. And it should, again, as a test, as a trivial test environment, should come out of the box with a DevOps. So there should be no time, no time on a project when a DevOps sitting saying like, okay, guys, you have Azure, mm, such a surprise, never saw Azure. Or you have Amazon, no, oh, really, Amazon, and they have two service, services to deploy there. Mm, never saw that configuration. And unfortunately, in my experience, I had it in my past. When, when we kind of hired quite senior DevOps, and basically he came and said, you know, you have GitLab here, and you have Azure. It's a new configuration for me. I will be investigating for three weeks. So that that's waste. I mean, at least we, we can potentially justify it, but it's hard to justify it in front of a client because for the client, it, it, it definitely should come out of the box. So getting back to the day one, day two. So besides test environment, the, the infrastructure, the CI infrastructure and CD continuous de deployment infrastructure should be designed the way when there is no requirement for DevOps to control, to support us on a daily basis. So we should be able, if we design new service, if we, if we, because we can come up with new services every day, kind of, for instance, we had this, some some sprint planning, we realized that we need, I don't know, new image service or emailing service or things like that. And uh, we, we should be able to edit ourselves. And adding a service in one place should be propagated everywhere, which assumes automation there. And it should be easy to add, easy and not error prone. So, so it should be safe for people like the developers who don't want really to to dive very deep into that but they would like to have it stable and easy to implement and it's not that that hard and obviously it should be single click for deployment like we run a job from gitlab and it should go to test environment or to dev server depending on where what button we click that's it and all the discussed as obviously without automation, it's not, it's hardly possible, hardly possible to implement all the above without automation. So automation basically goes as a key thing throughout the entire DevOps operations. And later we, 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 I will click, quickly t t discuss what what stands behind the automation? What kind of skills we would like to see in, in, in DevOps for that? So day three comes and day three is kind of abstract day three. It means that we are ready for production. We are ready to, we kind of have some number of sprints behind. We made an MVP and we have some pre-production or even on, or even production environment. It's again, automation, automation, automation. Everything, everything should be automated. That's very important. So what's required, what from our perspective, from the perspective of a developer required as a knowledge required from DevOps. So first, definitely, definitely top three clouds, Amazon, Azure, and Google's should be by definition kind of known quite deeply by by DevOps in terms of mostly automation infrastructure in, infrastructure as a code implementation and knowing on of the of the base services uh, of those clouds and to have recipes for top major archetypes like three tier microservices and even driven. Three tier is is trivial application is trivial architecture. You, you definitely should know that it's UI, business logic, and database. 
it's trivial, but there are a lot of uh, still a lot of applications like that, and DevOps should should be able to cover that. They should know that it should be enough to tell them that we have three tier to 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 be able to suggest proper proper tooling and proper uh, services from cloud. Like you need, I don't know, Amazon SQL, or you need. I don't know, avoid suggesting like things like Kubernetes for three tier or I don't know, some load balancing and so on. Because for three tier, as if it is, if we refer to COD theorem, uh, COP theorem, it is consistent and available system. So it's not partitioned. So it means that load balancing is hardly applicable for, for three tier. But once we move to node architecture, which is microservices, it it moves us to from consistent to eventually consistent systems, which bring us think, things like load balancing, distributed storage, and so on. And that also should be known by 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 DevOps. And the last but not the least is an event driven architecture. It is where all message buses comes to the stage. It is when you need to understand what kind of message buses to use. What is the difference between queue and and so publish subscribe? It it, it is quite quite simple, but it should be it should be known. It's it's, it's important to speak the same language. Uh, and there should be some recommendations comes with with the DevOps like. If we have a project, what kind of repository should we take? Should we go with single repository, mono repository, as we usually call it, or it should be multi repository? Which uh, storage, which source control to use? GitHub, GitLab, Azure DevOps, what kind of pipelines to use? So we are we usually open, but sometimes we have some recommendations for client. And for instance, in data, we, we are very flexible following customer recommendations and we try to adhere to their to their existing infrastructure to to and try to avoid introducing new new technologies so but those three uh but also there might be jenkins and things like that but those kind of three four are kind of top i don't know 90 percent of all different kind of repositories which potentially could be present uh, or we see normally in, in our projects so this is what should be definitely known uh, for sure next one and this one is is a pain because last years we, we see kind of movement toward clouds and that brought a lot of new DevOps who have no idea about on-prem. They just don't know how the particular server organized, how what kind of hardware required to 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 meet certain non-functional requirements, like how much memory do I need, how much uh, what kind of CPU, and how many CPUs I need to take. And sometimes it's needed. So. Some basic knowledge is definitely definitely required here. Uh, in taking again back to infrastructure as a code, it's it is important to know basic basic tooling, well known tooling. It's not they not basic. They they quite comprehensive, but uh, but they 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 they're, they're well known. Terraform, CloudFormation, and Amazon SDK or the SDK from from Azure. Those things are very useful for for making our developers' life easier, easier. They are very easy. So, what kind of issues, what kind of problem we usually see, or I personally saw in in my in my past experience? DevOps rarely can develop. So basically, they understand something. They they kind of grew up from system admins or probably testers, and they cannot write code. 
the code of the quality we used to we used to have in, in development and that makes us kind of struggling with supporting it because we cannot really support code with a lot of copy paste we understand that it's error prone we we we, we try to avoid it all the time the code usually is quite badly written and badly kind of quite buggy so it is kind of being devops you should be you should be a lot of dev you sh so you should be focusing on improving your development skills and you should know at least one developer one, one development language quite well doesn't matter which one probably go or things like that but you, you should you should go this way it, like I mentioned, yeah, the code is quite bad. And so it means that we end up having that bad code. We end up that we, we, we spend some time on automation, but is autom this automation rarely work as we expect. Like for instance, there are builds on, on GitLab, which last forever or run forever. For instance, if we have a kind of built on commit then it starts not all, it builds everything absolutely everything not just a portion i've changed but then it it runs all the slow test and it basically takes i don't know 30 or even one hour to complete and it is what we can hardly accept because the pace of pace of commits sometimes is quite quite high and we need to to be able very short turnover between we commit and we have it validated so kind of normally normally built on commit should take i don't know for me less than a minute but kind of if it is five minutes then probably acceptable As I mentioned, lack of development skills lead us to inability to understand what happened if something went wrong. If, for instance, there was an exception, they can even hardly point to the service which actually failed or kind of help us to identify the problem. And in this case, they act just like you know like messaging messaging who tells you that something went wrong and you as a developer need to go deeper and investigate what happened so they do not perform any sort of any sort of filtering for the problems because sometimes those problems are not really development they still could be could be infrastructure problems but they just don't understand it also, they, they don't understand the software development life cycle. They don't understand processes with, they do not participate in the processes. They kind of sit outside of the team while they should be part of the team and act with the team. And that's quite significant. So, so that, 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 that should, that definitely should be, should be fixed. Another thing that they do not understand the architecture and components interactions. So if we, if we talk about microservices, they usually do not care why and how the components talk to each other Be because it's basically from their perspective, it kind of sort of out of the, uh, kind of out of the equation because they think that Okay, it's the developers, they created some services which talk to, to, to each other somehow, but why should I bother? But the thing is that without understanding that, it's hard to understand what went wrong, but it usually goes wrong, at least during development. It's usually something often fails and breaks and you need to be able to figure out what happened. For instance, we had a situation when when a DevOps deployed something, kind of, he updated the script to deploy 
services to Kubernetes in Azure, but he didn't even try to, to do a smoke test. And that took us, as, as far as we had, we had different time zones, that took us kind of several days to make something running for the first time because he deployed something. I tried to check it. It didn't work. I communicated back. He tried it next day. Again, didn't test it, communicated back. I tested again, didn't work again and so on and so on. So, so that takes that, that's a basically very annoying waste because why not just go and click a few services and ensure that they actually work as expected. You don't need to, to understand it in details, but I want you to ensure that if there is a rest service, for instance, it should, it should reply back when you go to the, to the appropriate URL. And as I mentioned, they forgot about on-prem, like, uh, they just don't know what to suggest if we, we end up with on-premise installation. And one more thing about requirements uh, in, uh, in, in the forest, usually we have a problem with performance. And again, usually solution for those problem from DevOps team is to have to buy larger machine. Unfortunately, that's not a solution because the thing is that there, there are two types of scalability, right? So first scalability is which called scale out. Scale out is when you have one server, another server, another server, and if you do not have enough capacity, you just add another server. That's scale out. Scale up. It is when you improve just a single node, just a single server, kind of adding more memory, more CPUs, more hard drive, faster hard drive, things like that. That is scale up. And scale up goes, the price of scale up goes exponentially. So basically, if you want to have kind of double performance of your machine, you usually need kind of to quadruple the cost of this machine. And it's not, it's not acceptable in, in our world. It's, it's hardly, hardly doable. And sometime it, it even assumes redeploy of everything on this, on the machine, because uh, clouds do not support such a, such an upgrade. So you cannot easily add new memory, add more memory, add CPUs. It's not always possible. Sometimes you just need to redeploy everything. So it's not really kind of a solution which you can apply quickly. So it's, it does not support for elastic scalability. So real life examples. So we had a project when setting up simple GitLab pipeline took us three weeks just to set up a pipeline. Next day we had a server, dev development server for just a four trivial .NET services, and that service server cost us seven seven hundred per month because it has some SSD with a lot of gigabytes with some enormous amount of memory and so on. Helm charts, thank you. They they existed. It's perfect to have them because they simplify deployment so much, but. For all the services, all the services within the Helm hierarchy, we had all the inf all the information just copy pasted, copy pasted, probably fifteen times. I do not remember the exact number, but try to imagine what if you need to change something. How 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 probably you you, you do mistake theory, it's the probability theory high. And that's because, but for, from develop, DevOps perspective, it's fine. It's, it works, right? It's, it works. Why not? But from developer perspective, it's not acceptable because we do not allow such a copy paste, copy paste ratio in our code because it's, we understand it's, it's hardly supportable. So that's why they should learn 
basic development because they should understand that to, and avoid that because Helm chart obviously supports it. I mentioned earlier, I gave an example of slow GitLab, GitLab pipeline. And, but <laughs> the fifth one is very interesting because it's like with, with us, like with developers. Developers always kind of hate the, the previous developer work. They always say, okay, that's, that's a crap. I need to redo it from scratch. But we all should understand that that's not the right approach. It's, it, it, should, it could not survive in the long term. So that, like for us, it's it's the same, the common problem, and we should kind of together solve it. So what 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 would I recommend as a kind of as a final word? I would recommend to start learning developer needs. It's important to understand why do we do certain things? Why do we need certain services? What kind of hardware we need? What kind of automation we need? What kind of different pipelines we need? And understand project goals. Project goals means somehow understand what the project does from the business perspective. Because in my experience, DevOps try to position the cell, they, themselves as visitors to the project. So they kind of come for a week or two or month to do something and then leave. It's hardly work because they do not understand the goal of a project. And that leads to, to problems with improper hardware, improper scripts, improper and everything. So understanding of project goals is very important. Learn programming for automation. I mentioned that already. Learn cloud internals. What, what do I mean? I mean that you should be able as a developer, as a DevOps, understand what stands behind certain cl cloud native service. Like for instance, uh, there are some key value the key value databases uh, in Azure, which price goes exponentially when you add more and more collections to it. It's called Cosmo DB. And it was kind of big surprise for us, but it is something what DevOps should understand. Like, what if I would like to extend my database two times? How much will it affect my, my price, my cost of ownership? What if I need to, I need to in, increase throughput of, of my network two times and so on. Next one is learn hardware internals. It means that you need to understand CPUs, different systems, different types of memory, different hard, different storages and everything to, to be up to speed with on-prem installations. And as the universal recommendation, please prepare standard recipes because we as developers just rely on, on DevOps to have things ready for and helpful for development. We don't want to spend time on choosing between Azure DevOps or GitLab. It doesn't really matter for us which one to use. So that's pretty much it. 